for sale. Log on today and post your free classified. You'll reach thousands of shoppers who check our listings every day. Are you a business looking to get a corner on the internet marketplace? USA for Sale can help you reach your target audience in Ocala, the villages, and statewide. There's no better place to reach shoppers than right where they shop. Let us show you how. Learn more by calling 352-629-1663 or visit us online at usaforsale.com. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Uh, five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this Thursday morning. Every once in a while, we'll have uh, a book to talk about by an author who has had um, a, a, a true life story that he or she wants to share with us. And uh, the, the story is, of course, compelling and moving and, and I'm trying to group everybody into one little statement here as much as possible. But every once in a while, and we have one right now, the, the story not only tells you the story, but also gives us a little information, the rest of us, about how maybe society can improve some of the things that it doesn't, that it doesn't get quite right. Um, William P. Dunn IV is on the phone. Um, he has a book. It's titled Walking with the Light, Sandy's Gift. It is a true story. Uh, Mr. Dunn worked on Wall Street in the U.S. government bond market. He has a pretty impressive uh, resume, as a matter of fact. Um, and he, he's on the phone right now not to talk about that, but rather to talk about his book, Sandy's Gifts. I'm sorry, uh, Walking with the Light. Good morning, Bill Dunn. Good morning, Bill. How are you? Good morning, Larry. How are you? I'm okay. Are you in Florida? Yes, I live in Fort Lauderdale. All right. Well, thank you for being on the air. Paradise. Where, oh, Paradise, <laughs> yes. Where'd you, mo- you moved there from New York? Uh, from northern New Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, yeah, Over here. Fort Lauderdale is another suburb of New York. I mean, another borough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, t- I, Robin uh, told me not to mention certain things about the story, so I want to be careful to ask you questions. But let me just say this, that when I was looking through the book, it, it occurred to me that you're sending out a message that's more than just your personal story. I mean, you've, you've made some observations that we can apply to things in the news. In fact, I think your publicist sent me something... Let me see. Comparing it to the Fort Lauderdale shooter, yeah. which I had wrote to him after that occurred. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So explain that maybe, and then we we can get into it. But I guess for the first off is uh, tell us who Sandy is. Sandy was my late wife. The okay. book starts the night that I met her and carries through through our lives until her passing, <laughs> and includes some very rather, um, I guess, odd or spiritual things that occurred after her passing. As you know, if you've read it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we consider them mental health issues, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, we live, look, I, I'm just a guy who grew up. I had a paper route. My father had a stable. I sh- shoveled horse manure for years, okay, as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be a forest ranger. Dad had a talk with me and then said, you know, if you do what you <laughs> want to do, you wind up, you won't be able to afford a fishing pole, but you'll live where you want to fish. So I didn't do that. And I wound up, as I say, on the canyons of Manhattan instead of the canyons of the dreams west of the Mississippi. So yeah, right, um, right. It, it kind of follows our lives together. The beginning of the book is about 100 pages long and shows how we had a normal life together. It Wh- shows the ups and downs. Yes, go Wait, ahead. Where did you meet her? Where did you meet Sandy? I met Sandy at a party. I walked in with three or four of my friends, and she was. Sta- I opened the door. I, I was the last one to go in, and that, there she was, and she and I just locked eyes. Love at Got first it. sight. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. That's a sweet story. Uh, so so um, was she in the same career as you, same profession? Um, no, she worked as a, in a printing company in New Jersey, one of the largest in the, at the time in the state of New Jersey, called Compton Press, a sheep head printer mm-hmm. in the yep. production area. Okay, now not to jump forward too too quickly, but you mentioned we we mentioned in the opening the mental illness, and in almost in the same breath, you said spiritual issues. It, it, can you explain why why you said spiritual issues? Well, um, it's it's kind of odd, but I, I, after she passed away, I was in a real I, I guess you call a funk. I thought I had failed as a husband with all the things I tried to do to get her help. I instigated a litigation which we prevailed upon six years later. And the reality was I met a woman by the name of Gloria Wyken. Now, I thought she, I, I went to an appointment through my accountant, Brian Corcoran. 
handling his aunt's money, got sat there for this two-hour thing, and this woman kept talking to me, and at the end of the day, she said, Bill, I need to speak with you. And bottom line was, she gave me messages for my late wife. Now, I never realized that I thought Gloria, and we talked a number of times after wow. that, and she told me things that actually came true. And a couple, a number of years later, in 2014, when I had kind of completed this manuscript, I called her in December. And it was very odd when I called her. And this is something I didn't write in the book, Larry, because people would think I'm crazy. Some people think I am anyway. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I called Gloria in December of 2014, and she said, Bill, I've been expecting your call. Sandy came to me again in a group session. I haven't seen her in years. And she goes, she has a message for you. You need to finish it. I said, what did you say, Gloria? She goes, you need to finish it. And then I went on to say, Gloria, listen, I've written this book. I'd like your permission to use your full name. It turned out that shortly thereafter, my daughter came home, and she told me that Gloria had a website. And I had no idea this woman, who I thought was a little hocus-pocus lady, mm -hmm. had been interviewed by Tom Brokaw, Rosie O'Donnell, had all these credentials, and the medium that I met is actually a world world renowned. So I, you know, it, it kind of changed that my is awesome. beliefs. Does that make any sense? And I don't understand yeah. it. Yeah, it does. And so, so tell me, when did Sandy die? Sandy passed away on November thirtieth of two thousand and six. Two thousand six, and and your first it was, a it was a suicide. Okay. And your first meeting with uh, with Gloria was how long after? Was that? about a year and a half later on April twenty eighth of two thousand and eight. Can you, can we talk about the suicide a little bit? What do you understand yes. why she killed herself? Is there that I, I, I really basically what happened, Larry? Is my wife? We lived on a six acre horse farm, thirty minutes from New York City. That was a piece of paradise. It's as nice as anything you'd find in Ocala. Mm -hmm. We I, I I rebuilt the whole thing myself with my own two hands. And what happened was Sandy's behavior. And I saw one event that occurred in August of two thousand and five. We were at a wedding and we went out to Long Island in the North Shore and. She got a very peculiar look on her face saying this was a mafia place and just got really strange for a short period of time. After that, I said, forget about this. We need to go. We went out for lunch after a four and a half hour drive after the trip from going, coming back from Lexington, Kentucky mm -hmm. the day before on a vacation. And while we were in the restaurant with my two children present, Sandy started to turn bright red and started sweating profusely. And I was, what's going on? Let's get to the doctor. And then she explained to me that she was going through the change of life, menopause, mm. rather early at 47, 46. But I said, okay, go see a doctor. For a year, she lied to me that she was seeing a doctor. Some incidents occurred in the summer that started getting her behavior got very odd a year later in the summer of 2006. My children were calling me. Mom's doing it again. And when I get there... Everything was fine. Now, my belief, because we do not know what she was being, tr she was taking a drug I found out later on called Geodon, okay? Mm -hmm. Geodon is described for schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia, at one moment, the person's fine, and then the light switch goes off, and this was her behavior. Now, she was eventually involuntary taken away from the home uh, because of some peculiar things. About a week and a half before um, she was removed from her house in a straitjacket, she basically jumped from a moving vehicle with myself and the children in the car at 25 miles an hour. What was, okay? Were you driving? I was driving the car. Okay. We were leaving to go to our camp up in the Catskills oh for the weekend. Oh, my gosh. And she, all of a sudden, I, my daughter, my youngest daughter, screams. And I look, and there's my wife rolling on the ground. Oh, my about, gosh. About 200 yards from my house. And basically, I said, that's it. Let's go to the doctor now. Let's go find out what's going. I won't take my medicines anymore. I'll get a change of prescription, she told me. What happened was, and, that, and really what happened was the Sunday evening before she was taken away from our house, which I think was August 19th or 18th, I just don't remember the exact date, of 06, I was sitting reading the newspaper, and there was a picture on the, in the front page of the Daily Record of a 12-year-old boy, Jack Comiskey, whose mother suffocated him. And it said that she lived nearby in, Berners, in um, Basking Ridge, New Jersey. We lived in New Vernon, which at the time of my wife's passing was one of the most expensive zip codes in America. It was the, it was the most wealthiest town in New Jersey, okay? okay right. And the bottom line was is that I read this article, and all of a sudden I got a knot in my stomach. I go, wait a minute, this is worse. I, I don't think it's menopause. It could be something worse. And my daughter related to the Dyfus, the, the, to, to the uh, Dyfus people and police that the night, that, that Sunday evening, 
she looked at me and said, what's the article? I said, oh, nothing, and she wanted to read it, and she, gave, she looked at she read it and gave me a very lo- odd look, because she was getting weird that evening for some reason, and said, I would never do something like that, and I went, uh-oh, there's a problem here. Oh, wow. I eventually, wow. I eventually got her into... The police came on the following Friday trying to get to see doctors, et cetera, et cetera. And then what we found out from my 12-year-old daughter that that evening, Sunday evening, I saw my wife curled up on the, on the, in my daughter's room. What I didn't see, she was holding a 14-inch carving knife laying next to her daughter oh, on, on the floor. Oh, God. Yes. This was disclosed wow. by my 12-year-old daughter. Eventually, Larry... She, she, my wife, in hospital records, actually stated when she was in the hospital, she thought she was in a reality show. Judge Robert J. Brennan overruled doctors who said she needed to go to a long-term facility. I was trying to make arrangements. I was barred to go to her hearing because of the HIPAA law, the Patients' Privacy Act. It prohibited me from being in a court of law, even though I had a letter. She had the right. Okay, so here I am paying the health insurance, paying bills for all this stuff. I'm not allowed to know what's going on. Judge Brennan overruled doctors and let her back in the house oh. with the Division of Youth and Family Service to, to monitor the household. The representative came one time. I reached out many, many times for months on then. They came one time. They were supposed to come every two weeks. And two and a half, two months later, they finally came. I would later find out through a litigation that I filed against the state of New Jersey, and I wish I had sued the Harding Township cops as well, that basically they falsified documents, they shredded documents, they did everything in their power because they never thought they'd be caught. Well, we won six years later. I won as large an arbitration by law as you can for my two children. And so I've written this because of the injustice that was done to my household, okay? And if I'm an educated man, who could work on Wall Street, start in the back offices, work his way up, and sit the 105th floor, work at Cantor Fitzgerald, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Running, running a desk. If this can happen to me, it can happen to you and to any single other person in the nation. And I will say this, and let me finish this. Ask Rosie O'Donnell, because in 2016, she left The View for a reason, citing personal family issues. Five months later, she went to the public at large asking to help to find her 17-year-old adopted daughter with mental health issues. Got it? I think that says it all. How's that one? Yeah, that's and absolutely... I, wow. That is, and, and it sounds like what you're saying is that we don't really treat mental health patients the way we should to protect not only themselves, but the rest of us as well. Correct. Correct. I mean, we just had a shooting that occurred here in Fort Lauderdale on yeah. the 6th, of basically, that January 6th. The gentleman, who was a military vet, okay, was ill. He went to the FBI on, Jan- on, on November 26th of, this year, of mm-hmm. last year. Mm-hmm. The FBI has said, I'm hearing voices, and they're telling me, to, by ICE, that they're telling me to kill people. Yeah, yeah. What, is the government, what did the FBI do? Nothing. Guess what he did? He did exactly what he said he was going to do. We're prohibited because of this Patient Privacy Act. Trust me, I've lived through it. Doctors couldn't tell me anything. I'd ask questions, and I was rolling my eyeballs. Here we go again. That's crazy. Right. Wow. See, uh, th- there's more to this book than, mm-hmm. than your sweet story. Uh, uh, oh, no. gosh. I'm sorry, Robin, you have something. Uh, you had uh, said in, in your book that an autopsy was recommended. Yes, and they did an autopsy. Nothing was found. Nothing. So there, okay. there, what were they looking for? There wasn't anything abnormal with I, the brain I, stem or anything then? No, no, they didn't find anything. And basically, they didn't, I don't know what they did. My personal belief is based upon, if you've read it, what the police mm-hmm. did behind my back is the police were looking for the fact that they wanted bruise marks and all that because there were rumors being circulated by people in the Harding Township, the New Vernon Police Department, Fire Department, an ambulance corps that I beat my wife and children. Uh, okay, oh my so gosh. you know we didn't look. I lived in one of the nicest places you could live in. We didn't associate with a lot of people there. I just I I did my job. I went to work. I tried tried to provide, and it wasn't that Larry. I didn't. It's not like I didn't have the resources financially to get my wife into any place. I was a very wealthy man compared to most. Okay, yeah, yeah. but I you- was prohibited by law. But you had had also called the school not to, to to tell them not to allow her to pick them up. 
Yes, because there was a safety order, and the only thing that Sandy did was honor that safety order. I mean, when she was told she was supposed, she was released on the, the Sunday of Labor Day weekend, and she was supposed to start her outpatient treatments on Tuesday. She didn't go Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And I said to her Thursday night, if you don't go, I'm calling the hospital and the police. And she finally reluctantly went. She was disillusioned. She, the doctor, Contini, I went to see the doctor two weeks after she was in, after the typhus worker showed up on the 13th of September. And on September 27th, I went to go see her at the hospital myself going, this isn't working, there's something wrong. Her case, her outpatient therapist wasn't there. I talked to the head of the hospital, and he said to me to the face, he said, Bill, your wife shouldn't be here. She needs to be in a long-term facility. I said, please call Dyfus and explain to them. He put a call into our Dyfus worker who never bothered to return the call. It was, oh. I, I, I oh look at all gosh. the circumstances. Dude, I, so it sounds so, you know, I've heard this before, not this exact story, but I've heard stories of, you know, and, and forgive me if you work for the state. I'm not grouping everybody. But you. But the state ha- has their hands tied when they have a bad worker. They don't know how to get rid of them or they've got seniority or mm-hmm. whatever they call tenure. Come on. It, you gotta, you got to let go of people who are horrible. Um, I look, call them, Larry, I call them public disturbance. Yeah, that's, that, that's a great public word. Public disturbance. That's a and great word. And we need to have the right. And, and we just elected a new president. There's a new sheriff in town. And we need the right to dismiss incompetent government workers from their jobs. Absolutely. They get promoted and they move forward. And teachers, and too. We, I mean, he, ab- teachers, absolutely. You know, up in, in, uh, in New York, there was a story on, uh, gosh, one of those, you know, those network things where they do these investigative reports about these teachers that just sit in the room because they, they've violated so many laws, they don't let them teach anymore, but they keep them paid. So, yeah, because so, yes. of tenure. Yeah, so they, they spend their, their day reading books and playing video games and stuff, and mm-hmm. then they go home. Collecting Correct. a paycheck. All right, let's, let's, Correct. let's take a, a breather, a break, and uh, we'll be right back. What a fascinating story. I want to ask more about Gloria and, and the okay. con- conversations from beyond as well. We'll, okay. be, we'll be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. On this Thursday, turning out mostly cloudy and breezy with a shower or two in the area this afternoon, the high 78 to 82. Then partly cloudy and turning a bit cooler through the night. Those ranging from 48 and a few inland spots to 58 along the coast. Friday will be a breezy, cooler day with clouds and some sun high 65 to 69. And on Saturday, some sunshine followed by clouds and quite cool high 59 to 63. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm Joe Lundberg. Well, the holiday rush is over, and it's time to return the ties, the knitted sweaters, and those presents that didn't quite make the nice list. And go try something you've always wanted to, like learning to fly. At Ocala Aviation, they make it fun and easy, and you can start by taking one of their Discovery flights. For only $99, you get to go up in the airplane with an FAA-certified flight instructor and actually fly the plane yourself. It's a perfect way to see if flying is for you. And once you get that ultimate feeling of freedom, Ocala Aviation can train you to get your pilot's license. Ocala Aviation also offers commercial flight training for those looking to make a career change and enter the world of commercial aviation. Ocala Aviation is conveniently located at the Ocala International Airport. So if you're ready to start your adventure, stop by or give them a call today. 861-7484. That's 861-7484. You'll be glad you did. I know I am. Ocala Aviation. Your adventure starts here. Hi, I'm Leah Caruso with Strive Rehabilitation, inviting you to tune in to the first and third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. to learn about the latest advances in health care available right here at home. Ocala Regional Medical Center and Strive have teamed up to bring the most qualified medical professionals on the air to answer your questions and bring information to help you in your decisions concerning your health. Again, that's the first and third Thursday, Health Matters. Hey, this is Dan. Let me ask you a few questions. Does your boat look better with the cover on? Has your car's interior seen its better days? Stop using a towel to cover up those rips in the golf cart. Isn't it about time you had it restored to better than new with a custom upholstery from Captain T? Captain T's upholstery has been right here in Ocala for nearly 20 years, so they know how to make your ride one of a kind. Whether you want to take that classic ride back to a factory look or put your favorite sports team front and center, Captain T's upholstery is who to call. 352-369-1810. That's 352-369-1810. 
or stop by their location, 5030 South Pine Avenue in Ocala, just past the drive-in. And of course, don't forget to visit them on the web, CaptainTUpholstery.com. The very best in quality is Captain T's Upholstery. All right, 24 minutes after 10 o'clock. Good interviews go by fast. I, I, that whole Einstein theory about time being relative is exactly right. It, it all depends on who the guest is. <laughs> I, don't <know> if Einstein, <laughs> I don't know if Einstein did a, did a talk show. Uh, our, our guest is William P. Dunn IV. He I, uh, introduced himself as Bill Dunn, so that's why I've been calling him Bill. But that, but William P. Dunn the Fourth is what is on the title, uh, the cover of the book as his uh, by. Uh, art, author name. Yes. Uh, the book is called Walking with the Light, Sandy's Gift, and uh, let's continue with this conversation. So, okay. rather than retrace what we've already said, uh, I'm sure the listeners who are w- listening on the radio have listened to everything, and those listening on the internet, they can rewind this tape, or whatever you do on videos. But I wanted to ask you about Gloria. Gloria, we said, you said, was a well-known psychic, and she started giving you messages from Sandy. I well, ha- we ha- we ha- I want to tell you something real quick. We had a, a psychic on like a week or two ago, or whatever, and she was talking about people talking to other people who've died. And I said, the thing is this: if somebody was to ask me a question right now, I I'm almost ninety percent of the time going to say I don't know because I don't know. I don't know much. I do a radio show, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so if I die and people are going to ask me questions. You're not going to get much. <laughs> I'm still going to be an I don't know kind of a guy. Uh, but the, but then the psychic said, no, 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 you don't understand. When you die, you have this connection with God and you know everything. And I said, oh, well, that's going to be awesome. I'm going to know everything. So did you, I mean, did you believe it right away that you were really communicating with Sandy? Well, what happened when I went to this appointment for my, my accountant, Brian Corcoran's aunt, and invested money, she talked to me. And the things that she said to me could have only come from somebody from beyond. Okay? Isn't that amazing? Now, now this, gets, this gets really odd. I, I broke down. I started to cry. I went back to the bank. A friend of mine goes, who worked at the bank as an investment officer, I went to go bring the paperwork back. Brian Corcoran, uh, uh, Brian uh, Lang is walking out of the office. He goes, Bill, you all right? He goes, you look like you just, he goes, he goes, you look like you just saw a ghost. I said, I just talked with one, Brian. Mm-hmm. I said, let's sit down and talk. I said, remember a week ago we were having sushi? I said to him all these things. I go, I just came from a meeting and I got these messages. Now, this is what's really strange, Larry. I, when I broke down, when Gloria told me these things, I broke down. I started to cry because I, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mm-hmm. I said, can I take your phone number? I'll call you. Three, about three weeks later, I decided to call her. I picked up the phone. She was there. It didn't even ring. I don't understand how that happened. She starts talking to me, and she starts giving me some more messages, okay? Um, she says to me in this, in this telephone call, because I only called her two times afterwards, she says, Leslie needs to get the blue dress. And I went, what? She goes, Leslie has a dance, and she, your wife wants her to get the blue dress. So... I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, heard. About two and a half weeks later, my daughter is getting ready for gradu- high school, uh, gra- uh, graduation from eighth grade, and then says to me, oh, Dad, we need to get a white knee-high dress, okay, for graduation, mm-hmm. and I'll wear that to the dance. I'm like, what dance? She goes, the cotillion dance. I had paid for this back in September of the previous year, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Didn't even remember about it. And it's a formal dance for girls in the area of uh, the different towns, and young boys get to go to a big catering hall. So I said to her, no, no, Leslie, we're going to get, and so what happened was a couple weeks later, I I asked Leslie to help me cut the grass. She got an allowance, so I basically said to her, I I started the lawnmower, the secondary lawnmower in the backyard. We had a big piece of property, and the horses munched down four acres, but we still had two more left to cut. So I said to her, she came, I came outside, and, I, and she was supposed to cut the grass with me with the lawnmower. It's running for 15 minutes. I say, Leslie, what's going on? I come in, and she tells me how upset she is. So I basically said, I met this woman, et cetera, et cetera. So that evening, she cut the grass. I said, let's go to Macy's, Junior Miss Department, get you your dresses. She walks down the aisle. There's a powder blue dress, short sleeves, not strapless. She looks at it, and I'm going, oh, my God, Gloria told me this three weeks ago. She wants a blue dress. Sandy wants her to get the blue dress. She saw the blue. She saw that, then up on the left-hand corner hanging the wall is a beautiful pink dress. Well, forget the blue one. She goes to the dressing room. <laughs> she goes to the dressing room with two of these pink dresses. She's in there for 15 minutes. Then she says to the lady, get the other one that didn't fit. I'm like, Leslie, will you show me the beautiful pink dress? She walks out. 
in the exact dress Gloria said. Sky blue oh strapless gosh. dress. Oh my gosh. And I didn't even know until December of fourteen after talking to Gloria, I said, Leslie, how did you find the dress? She goes, Well, I tried on the first two and then the dressing room was filled up, so I took the other one and walked in the other dressing room. It was the only strapless blue dress oh, in the entire gosh. store. Oh, that she is... walked out and she goes, Dad, what do you think? And I could barely compose myself. Lovely. Please go find cried. your white dress. I took the wall. I did. I did. Oh, my gosh. I, I walked out of Macy's like, what the heck just happened to me? I could. You know. Oh, so my gosh. A couple, about a week later, a couple of days later, I called Gloria again. I picked up the phone. I did, she was there. I didn't even have to dial it. And she's like, hey, Bill, Sandy came to me the other day, and she has a message for you. And I said, what? I said, Gloria, hold on. How could Sandy know Leslie would get a pink dress? She goes, oh, they can go forward and backwards. Don't even worry about it. She's riding show horses with you like that. And my father, <laughs> my father, she knew we had a horse farm. She didn't know my father won. And my father, at the age of 16, won the McClay Cup, which is the you know, U.S. amateur of horseback riding, yeah. jumping and all that crap. So there's horses That's in the heaven. There's horses in heaven. She wow. said, she's wow. riding show horses with your dad because he couldn't do so because of health issues later on in life. And I went, oh, my God. So she says to me, she goes, Sandy came to me in color. And she goes, I've never, ever in my life seen somebody in color. And she has another message for you. You're going to win the lawsuit, and she wants you to move on and find somebody else. And I never told her we were filing a litigation against the state of New Jersey. Aww. You'll win the lawsuit. So, if, and, and I didn't talk with Gloria. A year later, I called her on April 28th of 2009. On the same day, a year later, and I said, Gloria... I can't explain this, but somehow you saved my life because I was a man who wanted to go and hunt down a judge and do what I wanted. I couldn't tell you how angry I was wow. with what that man did to my home. Bill, so. you, you you have an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it with us. I wish we had more You're time. Uh, I have a copy of the book. This is considered a pre-published version. Is that right, Robert? Yes. yes. Um, the so publication... I think the issue date is on or about February 15th of it coming up shortly. Wow. So I have a copy. If you want the copy, just one if one listener can call and ask for it. I'll put your name on it. It'll be waiting for you. In the meantime, um, Bill, we, we're over time, so I have to be very, very quick here. Do you have a website we can go to? Uh, shortly, there'll be a website from what uh, Gilbert explained to me, WilliamDunnAuthor.com. Okay. It's not there yet. And it, it, I think I found that on Amazon. You can buy it right now, right? No, somehow it inadvertently got listed on Amazon. Oh, I see it. Yeah, at a time. Yeah, it says out of production. So it's it'll be uh, it's uh, if if everything goes according to printing because I spoke with the printers yesterday, it should be ready for April for uh, the fifteenth of February. Nice. Uh, but it but it is on Amazon. It's just waiting for the uh, the, the switch to be flipped. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, we're waiting for the light switch to go on. Yeah, walking into the light. Oh, great, great ex uh, choice of words. Walking with the light. Sandy's gift. Uh, William P. Dunn the fourth. Thank you so much, Bill. That was awesome. You're welcome, Larry. Thank you. We'll time. be right back. Stay informed on everything going on in the villages with the Village Spectator newspaper. The Village Spectator is exclusively devoted to the villages with news, commentary, and more. And yes, they have Tom's Picks, a free referral for people who are looking for a company to do work for them. Tom's Picks will refer the company that fits your needs, and all we ask is that you tell them where you heard about them. Call Tom's Picks at 804-1223 and pick up your copy of the Village Spectator today. Now, read Ocala downtown newspaper online. When you go into Automax, Marion County's number one pre-owned dealer for over 15 years, you won't take the new car depreciation because Automax saves you thousands on late model vehicles. Browse the inventory online at AutomaxOcala.com. Then come down to see the great vehicles and upfront pricing in person. Compare up to 60 models inside the climate control showroom. So take your time. No high pressure, no gimmicks, no games. On the corner of 17th and Easy Street, Automax. Quality cars, outlet prices. Try to remember Live on stage, experience the magic that is the Fantastics. February 2nd through February 26th only, Ocala Civic Theater brings you this timeless tale of two stars.